Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. This is your friend Charlie Hunter up in Vermont. Um, down there in Texas is Miss Betty Sue behind the scenes pulling the strings. And we have a special, special guest today. One of my favorite, one of the people I would aspire to, to be like, because his love of painting and just his, his enthusiasm for life and for spiritual practice and painting is ins inspirational. It is a thrill to have uh, as our guest today, Mr. C.W. Mundy. Welcome, C.W. Hey, thank you, Charlie, man. It's great to be hanging with you. Yes. If we, if we can just cut down the train talk because you and I are, we love trains. We love trains. Ladies and gentlemen, C.W. was just showing me paintings that he did of trains and of a O scale model layout that he had. And he said he had desires to have a immense layout and his wife put the kibosh on that because <laughs> uh, the electrical work is so complex in a model railroad and it drove him so crazy. She didn't want to have to deal with him being nuts all the time. So instead, CW was taken on the much easier task of being a painter. Tell us a little about your life journey, CW. How did how did you get to this this place? Well, my my wonderful father, I would say, uh, he was you know of course in the service. He did his service in Panama, and I would sit on his lap when I was a real young little boy, and I would squeeze his left arm where he had the tattoo, you know, because he was a great big strong guy. And I'd be playing with his muscle and he'd be sitting there doodling. And he would be doing these stick figures like Grandma Moses and stuff. And then, you know, he would he would tell me what he was doing and I got really interested. So like every, I think the majority of every father who's had a son, the father wants the son to emulate what the father does. And the, and the son does too because he wants that approval. So I started. And that that was the whole foundation of it. Uh, and now, have you always been? I don't. I know little of your previous history. You you like 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 uh, Venus has has arrived fully fully grown. Um, how did you? Were you a commercial artist or? Uh, yes. Yeah. I uh, I did commercial art. I was coach Bob Knight, the great Bob Knight coaches. I was his first. Uh, artist and boy that there's a millions of stories there that are unbelievable because i loved uh, coach knight because he was old school like my father uh -huh. he called a spade a spade and there was no monkey business uh but I, I started out doing that i did a lot of stuff for the nba the olympics uh uh pga uh, uh all, all sorts of things and and that way i could connect the history of my love for sports. I played college, high school and college basketball. And so playing that, it was a way to do, to immortalize like, uh, you know, Dr. J, Michael Jordan, those guys all signed a bunch of my paintings. I got, I got to know them really well. We had the, uh, uh, second row seats at the Pacers. I was doing all of the, uh, artwork for them before the Simons came in and brought their in-house art group. So, yeah, sports and art uh, have been a great thing. The, the great, great thing about sports is it's a team effort. It's not me, 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 I, I, I. You get that uh, knocked out of you real quick. Well, but painting, on the other hand, is pretty, pretty isolating. So how do you, how do you uh, integrate? Uh, your love of team stuff with uh, the solitary existence of a of painting? Well, I, I would rather answer it this way. You know, I, I have a musical career and uh, we were out, I was playing in a band called the Swing Band, Tarzan Swing Band in California, and we were doing a concert in front of 10,000 people. And when you got them in the palm of your hand and they're yelling for more and more and more and going wild, that just enthralls it just does something to you it changes you and guess what brother i found out teaching <laughs> was the same thing huh. every time i did my workshops i'm on stage for the whole week and i loved it because you know i love people 
and I love to give information. I don't like to take any. No, <laughs> I need to, uh, but I love I love that sharing my love, the gift mm -hmm. that God has given me. Well, let's let's take a quick uh, tour through some of the work that you uh, supplied us today. Tell us a little about some of these pieces. And one of the things I want I, I would like people to keep. Uh, in their minds is one of the things I really admire about your work, CW, is that it feels to me like you, you paint what is moving you at the time. You don't spend a lot of time thinking about a particular look that you are trying to achieve. It feels very direct and very, you get the sense of joy in the way that you move paint around. Well, you know, I, 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 I learned how to roll that way by, it's a spiritual thing. You know, the self is, a, you know, you know, you want to figure out what's wrong, going wrong, just look in the mirror. <laughs> you know, you'll find out real quick. And so, you know, I, 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 what I'm excited about now, I do exactly what you just said. Exactly. I don't have to figure out the night before. I don't have to figure out the week before. All I just have to be is obedient to, to the Lord's voice. And then I, whoops. And then I, uh, I get up. And if I get out in the studio, buddy, I got news for you. It'll all come. If he wants me to work, I'll be working. And I like that because it's the, uh, the surprise element comes in and, and part of that surprise, you know, it's like you discover I di in the studio, I discover a photograph when you're playing air painting, I discovered that scene, you know, and so it moves you. Uh, the reason I put this in uh, to blow your horn too is because of the tonality. And I think this is one of the greatest things that you brought uh, to our world in the market was, was the uh, tonal uh, black and white sepia tones and doing that uh, because as you know the greatest statement i don't know you probably know who it was made the statement value does all the work but color gets the glory right right and and how many times do you, you know when you look through the magazines you can see that artists are trying to substitute color for value and you know what, man, I am so guilty of that until I just switched to my new palette, the three tone, the three, you know, red, red, right. bl blue and yellow and, and the additional white. White is actually a color, too. But anyway, my wife used to come in and bust my chops all the time. She says, why are you putting that psychedelic turquoise in there? I hate it. It doesn't go with the paint. I go, well, it needs something, you know. And she goes, it doesn't need that, you know. <laughs> And so the rogue, uh, the rogueness of it. But when you when you cut it out like this painting that we're looking at, the tonality is very subtle. And you know, when I when I was in, a, uh, I think this is uh, this is Bruges, isn't it? Yeah, in Bruges. Yeah, in Bruges. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, it's in Bruges. Yeah. And when I would see these scenes, you know, oh my gosh, you know. I I always wish that I lived back when all those superstars that we love lived, because the the oldness that has been wiped away by capitalism. I'm not against capitalism. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, you know, in America, you 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 put up a building. Fifty years later, it's torn down. They put up a bigger one, right? You know, or or less than fifty years. But anyway, so. Getting back to the whole thing, I love the tone alley, and I, and I love that's what you do, and, and that's why your stuff was so powerful and so refreshing. Degas made the, one of the greatest comments ever. He said, I'd paint everything in black and white if I didn't have to make a living. Really, really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Didn't know that. So, so this is a few years old, though, this piece. Yeah, yeah. This was done in uh, uh, 2000 and something. Okay. 2006 7 maybe okay well let's 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 leap ahead to what where you're where you are now because i i am thrilled with what you've been uh putting up of late um oh oh here we have another monochromatic one yeah uh this this was a 36 by 36 
and totally did it in black and white. I drove my wonderful wife nuts because she doesn't like that. She loves to see color, whether it's well, not turquoise though. Yeah, yeah, she does. <laughs> she, uh, you know. Anyway, so this one was a large one that I did uh, from a smaller piece, and uh, it was more about. Uh, the way that the paint is applied and trying to get the values right. And then I love to do outlining. I learned that from the great Frank Brangwen, who was one of the greatest mur muralists that uh, all the superstars, uh, Rockwell, uh, N.C. Wyeth, uh, uh, just to name a few, Pyle, all those guys uh, loved his mural work, and they stole that idea of, uh, you, you know, outlining. Even if you go back to uh, 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 Bougereau or Bougereau, however you pronounce it, I did a thing on Facebook and showed how he did all of the slight, slight outlining to bring out the form, you know. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that paint that say, you know, line is, no, that's only for drawing, but, you know, Mary Cassad did a fine job with line and her and her beautiful paintings with the children and stuff. So, so I, I don't adhere to that. I, uh, but anyway, so this was, I did a whole series of black and whites because Charlie, what I wanted to do was cut out the color and then really school myself like you do every day when you do those, uh, you know, you're a guy that you have to see value. If you don't get the value right, your painting sucks, right? Right, right. No, and, absolutely. And you have days like that, of course. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I remind myself every day. Uh, I was doing a painting yesterday, and I looked at it, and I looked at the black and white of the photograph, and I looked at mine. I said, man, you are, what are you on? <laughs> you you missed it completely. Then I have to reschedule them. But I tell the students, if you get those masses and values set in, man, you're three fourths home. Right, right. You know, it's true. It's true. We were talking last week um, with Mitch Albala, and he has he talks about a 80, 80 20 rule, which I was unfamiliar with of eighty percent big shapes and twenty percent detail. Just you know, get those big yeah. shapes, get the values right, and you're most of the way home. Um, we'll we'll get into this outlining and application of paint when we get into the colored stuff. So let's move ahead to the next next slide, Betty Sue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that previous one, the the, the grayscale one of the Yellowstone Falls, that was thirty six by thirty six, three feet by three feet. This is eight inches by eight inches. But look at the power that that CW has brought to this. I mean, it has it has the impact of an enormous painting. So. You you talk for a minute before I blather too much, CW. You, you no, go no, I loved it. I love. Thank you for your kind uh, comments, Charlie. Uh, yeah, I wish this was a thirty-six by thirty-six. <laughs> yeah, I mean it could be. It could be very easily. Uh, and if I did do a thirty-six by thirty-six, it wouldn't look. It would have similarities, but that that water, the movement of the water, would have a different have another movement because that stuff is. You just go for it, and if it works, you know it. You see it. Your eyes see it. If your eyes see it and it's not working, then you're not done. You know. But what you what you don't want to do, you can't render this scene. You know, and, and I don't want to render anyway. Uh, it's not my personality, uh, but it is for other people, and that's fine and dandy. But I want to get the spirit. I want to get the feeling of that of that rushing. Uh, cavalcading water uh, that's coming out of a big pool of flat water, and uh, and so I just uh, I, I love to paint this, and it's got the Kleenex down on the bottom, to, you know, to to get that fluffed up and flipped, you know, frothed up. But you know, that's really what painting to me is about: is paint. I call it, I don't want to call it brushwork. People just talk about paint's all brushwork. No, paint is paint manipulation. Mm -hmm. There are all kind of ways. If I'm playing air painting and I'm doing uh, twigs on a branch on a tree, I pick up a stick and forget the brush and I scratch that thing in there with some paint, load it up with some paint. Then you'll get a real organic, natural look. But anyway, go ahead. Well, did, now did you, in, did you just, 
evolve into painting that way? Were you taught to, to try to remove that filter of, oh, this is what I should do? How did you manage? How do you manage to, to just remove that filter that so many, when I teach, it feels to me like I'm, I'm trying to urge people to walk through doors that they don't quite dare to walk through. How did you dare to walk through the door of just saying, ah, I feel, I feel that frothy water. I'm going to fluff that up with some Kleenex, you know, rather than say, can I use Kleenex there? <laughs> uh, well, actually, it starts way back when I, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was an illustrator sports illustrator and everything was photorealistic i was in love and i'm still in love with norman rockwell and still can't paint uh like he can paint but uh i i had this this is i try to cut really edit it but it's a great long story but i really try to edit it. i was trying to paint these swans from a photograph that i'd shot down in south carolina 36 by uh 24 36 by 24 so I set up my thing and I was in the studio and I started painting it. And I, you know, this is really when I was really trying to launch a fine art career, you know, because everything was so photorealistic and rendered. I, I, you know, and I was told by Satan and many other friends, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do this. You can't do this. You have to render everything. And so I'm painting this thing. Anyway, the thing, when I looked at it after I had worked on it for an hour and a half, it was horrible. It was so controlled, so contrived, so on what I did not want. And I was like, I was so distraught, Charlie, and the audience. I was so distraught, and I was beside myself. And I, I literally almost was crying and, and angry at the same time. I wanted to take... I didn't have a knife, but I had a pair of pliers and I wanted to take it and just stick it through the canvas. I was defeated. I was distraught. I, I took my paintbrush, my inch and a half paintbrush, that I was, and I took it and I didn't even look because my head was down and I was mad. And I just went, I'm going to destroy the heck out of it. I didn't even look up. I was still mad. I was. I started to clean off my palate. I wouldn't even look at it. You know, I was. I was still in it, and I was hearing the voice of Satan. You can't do it. You can't. You can't be a fine artist. You can't paint at least like you've always wanted to. Then I'm just getting ready to leave, and I go to pick up the painting. I take my hands, and I go up and look, and I went, "Oh my gosh." That's what I wanted it to look like. I changed two marks on that. And that was it. Hmm. And and the painting was great. That's what launched my career. And then it, right off the bat, here's Satan going, you can't call yourself an artist and just go mess up stuff. Paint stuff and mess it up and call it. <laughs> and you know what the good Lord said? Oh, yes, he can. Mm -hmm. He can do whatever he wants to do. Yep. It's it's and so that's how and, you know and that led to the Kleenex. You know, I had a I used to be uh, put full page ads on uh, on uh, what's that American Art Review, and somebody wrote me didn't take the time to call. He wrote me a letter and he said, "Your still life was beautiful before you destroyed it with all those Kleenex stuff." You know, and then I looked at his wife's painting and she had more edges than the Grand Canyon in her paintings. <laughs> and and so, but, you know, the whole thing was you have to learn these, you know, these these things and, and apply it when it's apropos, when you believe it's apropos to the painting. Right. That's, that's the tricky thing. That's the tricky yeah. thing. I mean, I'm looking at this as you're talking about that and you've got that. The, the, the wildness and gesture and the different textures of that gesture. But then you've got the discipline along the shore of like the, the, the shadow on that stick is a sharp, you know, a sharp edge on both sides. The shadow of, uh, of immediately to the left and above that uh, under the rock, that's, that's pretty defined. And then you've got a wonder, your, your, your control of chroma, you know, that, that shallow still water, 
and boy, in some of the later stuff we're going to look at, the, the way you can flip back and forth between still passages and noisy passages is is gorgeous to, 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 to look at. Well, thank you. You know, one of the things that I learned from uh, Bill Anton and, uh, and uh, T. Allen Lawson, who are two heroes of mine because of and what I glean from them, and I teach this and I share it with all the people I'm working with, is rest action. Mm. Like you said, the 80-20 rule, if you put 80% up there of really controllable rest where you've got a little bit of a value shift, or if you're painting in color, I mean, a slight value shift and a slight hue or tone tone shift, then and then then you go into the detail the 20 percent, and then you do that man it's a recipe for success because i thought being an impressionist i had to have everything loosey and goosey i really miscalculated and did not understand what i was looking at when i looked at some of the great impressionists mm -hmm. you know i used to think you know monet oh he's just broken color well look at you can see a white cloud shape and then it's got edge that you could cut you know, a uh, block of ice with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he had that rest in action. And all of the, I found that that was an ingredient in everything that I loved and, and all the great masters that they would have this rest action. When you think of Emil Carlson, he, you know, he said, put two at the three at the most objects and paint every and paint those as well as you can paint and keep all the other junk out of there. And he would have those dark, really, uh, really beautiful backgrounds and then and then put the action where he wants. And I think that's a real success been for me. Uh, and then we'll get to this one painting and I'll show you where I put it up on Facebook and I the next day and I said, boy, that thing is so no noisy. You know, uh, and and I had, there was a lady I won't mention her name. She's a really a well-known artist, and she said, "Now I know why I didn't like that painting." <laughs> <laughs> I liked that painting, but okay. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. Next slide. Okay. Well, this uh, I decided that what I wanted to do. This was the very first one out of the box, and it was my best one of where I just made up the whole scene. I, uh, you know, uh, we don't really know what we're drawing, uh, that we have that ability to draw from nature, you know, crime and that, like we've been, you and I've been painting for ages, you know, and we've been looking at stuff at ages. We've got a memory back in there, bank in there that you can draw from, but we don't think we can do it. You know, we don't think, I didn't think I could do it. And so that was a challenge. And then lo and behold, I did that. And uh, I, I, I'm uh, my friend, uh, Tad Retz. Do you know Tad Retz? Nope. Uh, yeah, he's a tremendous uh, young guy, 25. I want to break his fingers. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you spell his last name? Retz, R-E-T-Z, Tad Retz. He's going to be one of the big upcoming superstars. Uh, I'm telling you, man, his stuff is as phenomenal and he he and i have been you know really working over and studying uh Garodnici, dennis garadnici's work do you know his work i do not oh he's in my estimation uh it's g-o-r-o g-o-r-o-d gorod n-i-c-h-y dennis d-i-n-i-s he's ukrainian and not only myself but many have touted him as being the greatest living uh, landscape painter today. He's Ukrainian. And one of my friends, uh, Fred Delariso, uh, that lives here, he said, he made the great statement. He said, Garodnich, he's like uh, Levitan on steroids. Uh, uh, oh, can't wait to see them. Oh, yeah. He, I, I've got, here, I'll, I'll show you one. Oh. Now that that's 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 a Garodnici. Garodnici, Dennis Garodnici. Is that phenomenal? That's phenomenal. Is that phenomenal? Well, check this one out. Yeah. Oh man. Wait a minute. There. Yep. 
That's he, he is a guy that can paint a scene and make it look so realistic and believable. But when you look at it, there's no rendering. Mm -hmm. There's no paint by number. Let's draw in the scene and let's paint every little dot and cross every T and dot every I. It's real painting. Right. You know, it's real painting. Yep. This is the last one, but. You know. Yeah. Look at that. Look at the way that snow is laid down. Yep. Oh, he, he's phenomenal. He's become a very good friend and, and a mentor to me. And he's another young guy. I'm going to break his fingers. <laughs> no, but I... I can, his fingers going to be broken around here today. Well, he could paint left-handed, and so oh. could you if you're right-handed. I am left-handed. So oh, well, then you could paint right-handed. Because it's, it's up here and in here. But I think that's probably true. But um, next slide, please. Now look at this one. Oh my goodness! Oh, I hate you. Go ahead. Well, uh, this was uh, the uh, from my great and wonderful buddy who I love. I, I tell him I want to be. I would like to be his adopted father, but I'm too old, so I call him I'm his adopted grandfather, Tad Bretz. And he paints. Paints. I always wonder why. You know, I'm, I'm so. Plus, he paints phenomenal. But he told me, he said, I just use the, you know, the triad palette, you know, red, blue, and, and yellow. And I thought, hello, my wife and the turquoise and everything else, you know, maybe I might, I, there's something here. So this was the very first one out of the box that I used. Uh, I used French ultramarine blue, uh, cad red medium, and uh, a yellow, yellow cad medium and white and and uh and painted this painted the scene and i was really excited because it has the power it's got the rest the sky uh it's got rest in some of the shapes and especially in the shadows the shadows you you can have a little bit of vibrancy in there because you don't you want to have light in the shadows you can't just paint it a flat value and so uh but it's a beautiful scene of, of I love of Point Lobos and I love that area. Uh, what is it? Galapata and, and all of the, uh, I got a good friend now, Scott Hamill, that paints gorgeous stuff out there. He's a California painter. And, uh, and uh, I just love that area. So that, that's what I tried to do. I kept the shadow hard like it was. Uh, and played that up. And then sometimes what you want to do, uh, like I learned from Frank Brangwin, is where the light is meeting the dark and the shadow. If you put a, a darker little uh, razor line with the uh, palette knife, that'll make that shadow pop even more. And then you can do it like Rockwell would do. He did it on both sides. He did it on the light side and the dark side. Then you get a double pop. If that's what you need, if it's if that's what you want, and so that is the person who had asked earlier about what did CW mean by out, the outlining, that is what you are referring to. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, yeah. Outlining will bring out the form. If you think about it, that's why Brangwin did that with all of the uh, uh, murals because why the murals have to be read from fifty, sixty feet, you know, because at least because they're big, they're behind a great big bar, they're in a big Mm -hmm. uh, important room or whatever. And so they did that outlining so that the forms would hold together. They would do it very boldly. But that that would be something that I would in, really encourage the people that are listening to look up Frank Brangwin. It's a B R A N G W Y N, Frank Brangwin. And he, his stuff is phenomenal his black and white work charlie oh you would go nuts i oh. love brangwin i love brangwin I oh love oh yeah yeah he uh he's really been uh, one of my all-stars but one of the things i again would point out to our audience is you know part of part of the the <laughs> the, the the touching the fleece that we're always trying to do you know, how do we achieve this greatness you know, we, we think, oh, maybe there is a color we can buy 
that will, <laughs> it will convey grace upon us. That's that's me. <laughs> I did it. But you are now you are doing this with. I just it's it's wonderful to me that your darkest dark is going to be a mix of 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 uh, ultramarine and cad red medium, right? That's what your darkest. Yeah, dark. yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, and and you it, depending on how dark it is, then you can always add a little yellow, you know. Uh, but uh, but here here's the thing: after doing three of them that way, I got one coastal scene that that we're going to look at that has that. But I've switched to. Uh, Prussian blue, and most people will not touch Prussian blue with a uh, blue with a ten foot pole because they overdo it, and the chroma is so intense. But let me tell you something: you use Prussian blue instead of French ultramarine, and you can get better, richer greens uh, with that med cad medium yellow, and you can. Uh, uh, you can get sky color that you can't get. You just can't get with French ultramarine. I well, yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead then. Let's 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 move forward. What do we got here? What do we got here? Well, this this one was done with uh, the uh, French ultramarine, but the sky. Uh, one of the things that I've learned to pull these off uh, that I'm really excited about. In fact, not this one. One of them I spent. 45 minutes painting the sky uh -huh. because it was the technical thing. I wanted the, I wanted the transition. I wanted to have the glow of the actual light that, you know, that we're looking at. And then it, it can't have any brush strokes or really noticeable ones. It's not about that. It's about getting the feeling of opalescent light. And so once I got that, and then uh, and then I went in with uh, is this was this one done with the uh, new palette? Yes, yeah, this one, yeah, this was done with a three color palette. Look at that violet. Mm -hmm. The violet you know? is amazing. The the I would I would ask everyone to to look at what CW is doing in terms of how he's laying the paint down. What you just talked about, about the sky of not wanting the brush strokes visible in that. And certainly in comparison, I mean, maybe if we stared at it, we could see a brush stroke, but it is in comparison, it is non-existent with how the paint is being handled in the foreground. But the the violet gray shapes of the rocks, those that is amazing. That is an amazing bit of paint being laid down there. Well. Wow. Thank you. You know, the other thing is understanding value. So when you see the character of the little light on the tops of those rocks, it was just getting that value correct mm -hmm. because that's the way it was in the scene. And then the other thing that you mentioned about the sky and the light, the sky doesn't have any brush strokes. It's a clear sky. You know, the sky is clear. If you have clouds in there, now you can have a brush stroke. But you have to be careful about what, it, you know, one of the comments uh, that Dennis Gorodnici uh, has been teaching me and talking to me about was he calls it color perception. He said he's interested. He said nature has enough beauty in its own and it's our duty and it's his duty. That's the way he wants, he wants to capture the natural beauty. It's beautiful it's out there in its own naturalness but no us as artists we got to make it better i want to show my attitude and then you know you look at it and it's like fingernails on a chalkboard i remember a friend had painted this uh, snow scene with pink and purple and it was like fingernails on a chalkboard i went man nobody would want to be there in that environment <laughs> but uh, but the great old masters, they painted the snow warm. And Gorodnici, the top light that's coming from the blue skylight on the top is a warm silvery color, mm -hmm. a warm silvery color. And then the side light, the vertical light, which is uh, catching the, the actual angle from the sun, not the top light, but the light from the sun, then that, that could be warmer and, and lit. 
But a lot of people just paint snow. Well, it's snow. I'm going to paint it what I think snow looks like. Well, you're out there looking at snow. It's white <laughs> if, if you're not an artist, you know. Right. Well, I, 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 I am in awe of your command, both of the vocabulary of how paint is laid down and your ability to, uh, to, to hit that correct value. Um, as Jeff is saying, the variety of application is incredible. Even the back of the waves and those delicate fine strokes suggesting traces of foam. Action, rest, interesting shapes everywhere. Wow. Yep, I'd say that's pretty accurate, Jeff. Uh, uh, thank you. You know, uh, uh, Tim Newton, our good buddy Tim Newton, has, according to Don Demers, and I would agree with Don Demers, the greatest painting Frederick Waugh ever painted. And oh my gosh, you should see that see that see. he's got when that when the water's rolling over, it looks like a you would paint a cone, you know, with a value, you know, with the light on it and and the froth and everything. Oh my gosh, it's a masterpiece. And so I've always loved that. And when I saw this particular shot, I said, you know, I thought uh, you know, I channeled the sort of a, what Frederick thinking of how he would do it. And there are some cool areas that, where the water's frothing up. Like in the center of those waves, it's got a cooler blue to it than the warm that's down in the light. And so paying attention, this is what Grotted, she said, you paint the color perception is painting the natural color and not, not going with artificial. Again, as I say, the uh, and uh, basically a lot of them are the uh, neophytes, the ones that are getting into the business and learning how to paint and trying to figure out this and that. The paintings, uh, everything is so artificial about it. it. It's a nature scene, but it doesn't, you know. But also, too, I must say that there are a lot of people that don't care about the naturalness. But me, you know, God's done a, a beautiful job of giving us. In fact. God gave us color as an app. We don't need color to exist. We need value. We need black and white. That's why we got rods and cones. The rods we have are larger and we get, we, that sees value and the cones we are less and smaller, they see color. But we don't need color to exist, but he, he did that out of his loving good pleasure for us humans. It, that is that's fascinating because when, when I teach, I always say, or when people ask me why I paint plein air in monochrome, it's like, well, I've got it, I've got basically two and a half hours worth of time before the light totally shifts. Yeah, I've got to get my composition right, I've got to get my drawing right, I've got to get my values right, I've got to get my edges right, and I don't, I can or cannot do the color, so why add that? additional stress i've got those other four things i gotta get the color is gravy you know you know one thing i would add to that charlie that, that i'm finding out it is absolutely so much easier to paint with three colors you can't make a harmony mistake right. <laughs> you only got three colors that's a very very good point everything goes with everything right. whether whether you do less mixing of them or whatever, it is still going to work. Right. It's like cooking with with salt, pepper, and garlic. You, you're not going to be able to put nutmeg in there and throw the whole thing into some weird place. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I was doing. My wife was getting so upset. And I said, well, the painting needs something. And what she's saying is, yeah, it needs a better job of value. Your color is not the answer. I, I was actually at this late in the game, this is only about – Two weeks ago, I'm trying to solve paintings with color. What an idiot. This is why I love CW Monday. You are not, you are so in the game. You are so not putting yourself above the struggles that all of us have. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's, you're an inspiration. Next next slide, please, Betty Sue. Well, one thing before we start this, I wanted to say, Charlie, you know, one of the things I, I finally figured out, it is a blessing to have to get into a dog fight. <laughs> if you're not willing to, to get in a dog fight, you're missing the joy of painting because once you get out of a struggle, out of the dog fight, and you can go, whoo, man. Yep. 
Uh, my friend Tad Brett just told me the other day, he said, uh, his painting yesterday, he said, I, I got a headache. I had a headache, you know, until he finally did the right thing, you know, the one the one last thing that changed everything. And, and that you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to get, that's where all the money is. Right. The struggles and tribulations of life are what give you real standing character. I, I, I agree. When I was a music manager, my partner and I used to say, if it, when things would get us down, we'd say, if it wasn't a challenge, it wouldn't be a challenge. Yeah. If, you know, if, if we didn't, the struggle is, is the joy. It's, it's counterintuitive, but that's what is, that's what, if, if we just were able to, to do, if we were able to do exactly what we wanted to do and capture exactly what we wanted to capture every single time, that's really kind of the definition of hell. It's that, uh, yeah, you wouldn't be painting much longer because there was no there was no uh, discovery. You know, our great buddy Dan McCall told me the other day on the telephone. He said, he said, see Debbie about this very thing. He said, I go home really upset a lot. <laughs> I I leave those handicapped orphans, you know, on the easel, you know, and it's not solved. You know, my problem was I got so efficient at being able to paint. I, I saw, you know, I learned that from plein air painting to, you know, try to get uh, uh, a a decent painting all, you know, in one and a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour and a half, two hours, like you said. And, but, but I, I got so efficient at it, I didn't have any struggle. And it wasn't I, that I couldn't get to the next level until I'm willing to embrace the struggle. That's the message. I want to share, you know, Donald Put Putman told me many, many years ago, he said, CW said, on purpose, I put rogue color, rogue value and stuff down on my painting. And why do I do that? And he goes, because when I fix that, it ends up being the best part of the painting. And I looked at him and I said, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to deliberately putting yourself in it. Yeah. Now, Corias. Does CW still try to get the transitions leading from one place to the next, as you did with the previous works? And how do you get all that with all the texture? Uh, so I was still thinking on the last thought. Now, what's that? What? Totally changed. We're, 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 so, so the idea of transitions, moving moving the eye through the entire work, mm -hmm. if you are having, I believe, like, well, let's look at this one. This one has very definite areas of stillness, versus action yeah you know, the, the the title the title sand areas versus how the rocks are handled how do you how do you, with with such definite transitions between those between the action areas and the still areas how do you unify an entire painting when i got a great answer for that charlie uh our wonderful friend, Carolyn Anderson, who I hold up in such great high esteem. I think she's one of the greatest living uh, portrait and figure painters out there. And she taught me this a long time ago. She said, CW, and she did it on one of my paintings. <laughs> she said, you need doorways and windows. Why do you need doorways and windows? The reason you need doorways and windows is because you want your, just what that guy just asked that question, you want your eyes to be able to transition between forms. And, but you know, what people do is they'll paint, they'll paint uh, an apple, okay, of uh, a lot uh, of uh, front, uh, let's see, light source, core shadow, and shadow. But if you don't have a transition from the apple and from the background, if you don't invent one, it's like, and it's all encompassed, and there's no way to get it, there's no way for your eye to move into that apple. It's isolated. People paint way too much of their subjects. Everything's isolated. If you look at this, the bottom left part where the wet sand and the reflection, look how that value goes right into the, from the water goes right into there, and then it takes you right up in. To all that other part and then you come down the other side you come down and then there's a little place on that little chunk right there a little door a little window 
right down at the bottom again on the other side of the little small little rock. And you can do the same thing on the thing in the back. But uh, and then if you look at the that uh, little sandbar at, in the background there between that and the rock, look at the edge, the doorway from the sand into that rock thing. You have to if it's not there, sometimes you can see it. If it's not there, you got to do it because those little things uh, are are really so key that I can't, I couldn't, if there were anything anybody could glean out of this whole thing is Carolyn Anderson's wonderful teaching on doorways and windows so that your eye can move freely to discover the painting. Right. And, and I would, I would say to our audience, to me, I see the manifestation of that. Look at the, to the right of the white shape, that white shape in the center, the transition between the near rock and the far rock, the value at the right-hand side of that white shape, the value of the near rock uh, and connect rock, that is that is your doorway. Yeah, that's like a window. A, a door. I I I actually added to Carolyn's. I said window doorway. That's bigger than freeway. Okay. <laughs> because like down at the bottom, that's more like a freeway, the transition from the lighter sand into the wet sand. And then there's a little bit of a blocking point there. Right. Uh, uh, but, uh, but then also the transition of the blue reflection of the sky and then, and then the wet sand, you know, so I use windows, doorway and freeways because all of them are applicable. Okay. I can go with that. Now, is this also your three color? Oh yeah, yeah. It's. I had I had a lady make a comment uh, about this on Facebook. She said, and, and you know I I won't mention her name, but I love her because she's very frank. She doesn't pull any punches. She said, "You need to mess that up a little bit, CW." Little, little, <laughs> and yeah. and I think I think you know there's some validity in that because. It would still have the real feeling of realism, but you know, sometimes it is what it is, what it is, what it is. You move on and then do it and try it on another one, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. You drive yourself crazy if you attempt to hit yeah. perfection every single time. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. Uh, take us away, take us away, CW. Well, uh, the challenge uh, in this, See, what I did was, that's our backyard, so I knew we had that eight-inch snowdrop, and I told my wife, I said, boy, I'm going to get out there. And so I had my great big uh, winter boots for 35 below zero, and I so I go walking around. It's so funny, Charlie, when I first started, you know, like, playing or painting, I didn't want any snow tracks. I wanted to paint the virgin, you know, everything, and I didn't realize, the, you know, how much you can capture light. You know, and I learned that from Garodnici. So the challenge was the foot, the footprints or the boot prints on the left side uh, are are real. There are a lot more hard edges. And I look at the boot uh, steps on the other. I had to go in and destroy those. Whistler says, "I build and I destroy. I build and I destroy. I build and I destroy." And so uh, there are a couple like that one little. A uh, hot spot with a dark value next to it over in those areas is just one, but the other. But look at the violet uh, backlight on that shadow right when the when it intersects with the other one on the left. That's another thing that you can capture with that. Uh, uh, what I was really thrilled about that the snow, the covering of the snow is all from Garadnici's right. understanding of the top snow is you can get that warm silvery tone and different colors and values in that. And then, uh, but what I love was the backside of those trees, those two trees with the cool, uh, the coolness of the snow stacked on there, uh, getting you playing up. Uh, Carolyn corrected me on this. I used to say warm and cool. No, like you know, because I've heard you say it, it's relative, it's warmer or cooler. Saying warm and cool colors is stupid. And that's what I used to do for so many years. No, everything is relative. It's either warmer or it's cooler. 
And so I love the play on that uh, scene. And, and so I'm so excited to do this painting. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff says this concept alone makes him want to start exploring thumbnails tomorrow morning, finding ways to connect shapes and move the eye. And just again, ladies and gentlemen, look at how CW is willing to lose the edge. Just go to the upper, the upper right, go with that green, uh, with the, the evergreen area and going over to that first tree trunk coming down. You, there's a little, there's a color differentiation. There's a warm, warm, cool differentiation. Value is the same, but you just let go of that edge, and that's what makes it work. It's it's so kind of counterintuitive how letting go of things can make things read with greater clarity. Well, you know that that comes back to Dennis Garanchi's uh, teaching about. He says color perception. Everything and nature perception is really what he's talking about. And that's the way it appears in nature. If you squint, there's no edge there, exactly. you know, but uh, yeah, you have uh, edges are absolutely so, so crucial. And, uh, and you have, we as artists have the liberty. This is what Kwong and Ho and I were in the camp where, you make up the edge where you want the edge to really count. Like the tree that's bending on the left, look at that hard edge against that white. There's a reason why that is so hard. Now, Carolyn Anderson taught me uh, that if on a face, if you have a hard edge on one side of the face, the other side of the form, you play the soft. So you play hard against the soft. And that's what kind of is going on to that that tree it has a hard edge but it's interrupted by that little dot of white those things all of that stuff is so crucial you know uh and uh and you know what's what i love about this this thing looks so photorealistic you know mm -hmm. but it's not there's not a bit of rendering anywhere right right absolutely absolutely and 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 two th two things i want to mention one is what you're talking about is why i think sketching is so important oh i'm glad you brought that up because trying to trying to do all this stuff with with the values and the color and stuff is that is after you've got a strong armature you know and and the sketching is what's going to teach you about the about the edges you know where to let go of an edge and do a bad do a zillion bad sketches it'll make for good paintings you know well it's, charlie you know this is this is why i went to the black and whites because i remember my a wonderful studying that i've done all these years and continue to study all the time why did the great masters that did all those great religious commissions and all those enormous they them the artists and their apprentices did tons of thumbnails. Why did they do it? They vetted the subject. They wanted to know what all the alternatives, a great painter like they were, Ruben, any of those guys, uh, uh, Caravaggio, they vetted that subject, like you said, with thumbnails and, and this and that. And I'm so ashamed of myself because when I first started painting plain air, I was like everybody else. I couldn't wait to get out there and jump and get my feet wet. I didn't do... I didn't do this, <laughs> you know, until I learned, you know, I, I, I did start doing that, but I didn't do any of that stuff. And so uh, I've been talking with the people that I'm working with uh, and Tad Ritz and I had and, and Derek Penix, uh, who's a real close friend of mine. And we we're, we're always on the phone every day talking about stuff and, and that, that how important vetting the subject is. You want to paint a monumental, a masterpiece, a grand slam, 36 by 36, you're going to be a lot better off if you know that subject. Mm -hmm. And you need to know it well. And then you need to know, like, like Dan McCall told me many years ago, I start off from a photograph. That's just a starting point. Then I do all these black and white thumbnails, Charlie, like you, all these thumbnails. And then I find out, where I find my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, is that the last one, or do we have one more, Betty Sue? 
Yeah, so Brenda Salvia, right. Uh, Brenda says, initially French ultramarine blue, cad red medium, cad yellow, not sure if lighter medium, then you've switched to Prussian blue. So it's it's Prussian yeah. blue, cad red medium, and cad red light, and, I mean cad yellow light. Well, yeah, actually, actually what I did, you find this out, and, and this is another, uh, you, you say it's an accident, I say it's an accident, no, it's really the hand of God. Uh, d uh, doing things for me because I'm not smart enough. I didn't have any CAD red, but I had four or five tubes of naphthol red. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Naphthol red doesn't have the the sustaining sticking. I mean, uh, you know, CAD red, you touch CAD red into the, your paint pots that you're mixing, you better be really careful, buddy, <laughs> because it'll just overtake it. It'll just overtake it, but naphtha won't do that, and that's the nice advantage. You know, the other thing about uh, the, the so um, instead of using cad red, I'm using naphtha red because I don't have the cadmium. Now I like the cadmium and the yellow because you need that 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 strength to get the greens. Uh, when you're even when you're working neutrals and stuff, then you got to add a little bit more of the Prussian, a little bit more of the yellow to get it into the green green areas, but. But the other thing that's so special about the three, I call it the Trinity palette now, three colors. The great thing is it's you, it's so easy to mix. Oh, my gosh. It's so easy, you know, and, and it's so fun, and you can get the right value and the right color. I think that's what Hawthorne was talking about, you know, getting the right value and the right color at the same time when you're mixing. But you can do that so much more simply by having the, the triad palette. I am just shocked that here I'm 76 years old and I've been, I can remember Kevin McPherson telling me, you know, he used three colors and I went, well, I'm glad it works for you. You know, that's, that was my stupid thinking. But I always wondered why I had such beautiful, colorful paintings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, oh, so now it's Prussian blue. Napsol red and cad yellow medium. Yeah, and and, white. and titanium white. I, mean, I I use uh, alkyd whites because the paint will dry faster. You know, you want the piggy to go to market. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, Jeff had a question just a second ago that came up. Um, Betty Sue, can you put that back up? About indigo. Um, no, it's the one before indigo. It was about. Uh, it was about strokes um so many of the pieces seem about mixing paint application mixing on the canvas so many pieces seem to have strokes that are not fully pre-mixed resulting in a freshness that brings the painting to oh the that's a great point uh the did jeff bring this up yeah yeah excellent point because i learned from the great dan mccall and then i went to a museum in phoenix and i saw an enormous sand painting where they had the paint marbleized so what you do, you got your, let's say you got your pot value for your uh, your foreground green, you got your pot color for your purple mountains, and you got your blue sky, three pot colors. Well, if you're gonna, uh, what you can do, and it's really wonderful, is to take that, take your paint, or your palette knife, your paintbrush, and dip it in pure chroma, i.e. now it would be the yellow, the red, or the blue, Mix it in that and stick it in your uh, 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 stick it in your pot color and smear it on the on the on the canvas. You know, I said this so many times and it's so true. Uh, like my students, the best paintings that my students ever do it's their palette. Uh -huh. <laughs> a lot of them, it's the palette. If they just take a picture, they didn't know they were a great abstract painter, <laughs> but their palette is much better. They mix it down there, and, and then they stick it up on rogue color that doesn't work on top on right. their painting. So yeah, I think the discovery uh, uh, and and then let it and letting it happen in front of you. Oh my gosh! And you go, oh, don't touch it, and you know, leave it. And then if it's too obnoxious later, you you, you nuke it. <laughs> you know. exactly. Brilliant. Uh, oh, okay, so Edward wants to know your thoughts on indigo, and let's move to the next slide, Betty Sue. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, indigo, is that a blue? 
I, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I wish I could answer, but I have no experience with indigo, uh, and I and I don't. You know, I don't know. So. Now, is, is this also your? your oh story? yeah. Good lord, good lord, ladies and gentlemen, think of the amount of money that we've pissed away on various colors. We don't really need. We don't really need. Hey, I got it. I got something funny. You'll love this. This is why the art stores, Charlie, are in business. The paint companies. They got they got thirty thousand different greens from fluorescent to whatever you know, and same with reds and you know and it's all about making money you know they you know they want to they're in business and the and the artists are suckers like me I did it too you know like all uh, like all of us yeah. buying stuff that you don't need you know the the thing that I love about it, it's just the simplicity of the the three colors. It's the simplicity of life. It's everything. One of the things I wanted to point out about this, if you'll notice, because color is very simple. Color is learning how to play up complementaries, you know, and that's what you need to do. I used to paint these still lifes and I thought, why do I have a purple base, uh, a green apple, and a chartreuse something else, or, you know, there's no color harmony. Paint green apples with a red vase, or red flowers with a, in a green vase. Make the tablecloth a lighter value if the red apples make it a lighter green, gray green. Make the background if the vase is green, make it a red, gray. You know, so play up your complementaries. This is all about complementaries. But one nice thing that you can see on this. When I did the hot spot, it was the glory point of this painting with the sun. There is a warm, I know, excuse me, a, well, a, a, a cool dot. The lowest one is the coldest. The white dot is with yellow in it. And then right on the white dot is blue. Yeah, I was looking at that. That's brilliant. And so when you look at it, stand back, you get the flash. This is what op art was all about in the 60s. They played up the complementaries like Mondri well, Mondrian did. He, did. he did just the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. But, but, but they would uh, mix up. They would do squares and do the, put the same value and the same amount of chroma next to the next square. And then it would shift the values and make those similar, but, it, but, uh, but the, but the complementaries. And so it was a play and a flash. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times what's really great for you students to know when you're playing air painters, you're going to paint a green landscape. We'll paint a dirty reddish, uh, reddish violet red as your underwash right. and then put the green with the same amount of chrome over the top and let the holes pop through. Oh, buddy, you'll get extra flash. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. This makes me – I'm going to go – mess around with this uh this this trinity um because i love prussian blue i think i think prussian blue is just a charlie you, know, you would love it because i'm telling you it is like falling off of a it it's so easy this is what amazes me you know i have spent my whole entire painting career when i did illustration i had a rogue palette every day i never knew to put all my colors and line them up and everything like a jazz you know, musician would think, you know, I had rogue everything and all of this and painted with rogue palettes all my life. And here and now, just the last three weeks, it's like a whole new world. And these paintings are turning out was so rich and so real and, and they can be so beautifully colorful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am beside myself. Well, well, we've we've got. I've got. I'm, I'll do Corey's question. Want to do a question? I want to have a question about this. Um, but then, then we gotta we gotta wrap this up. I, I could talk to you all afternoon. But two questions. Corey was wondering if the brand of Napthal or and the brand of paint is particularly important to you. Um, so answer that one first, and then I've got one last question for you. Okay. Uh uh, yeah, you you met Michael Harding at you know at the yeah. at the Plain Air Convention stuff, and Michael was so so cool. I just fell in love with the guy because I loved his accent. Mm -hmm. I thought, man, this guy is so cool. And he goes, 
CW. You try my you try my pain, it would literally change your life. And I wanted to go like, you know, that. I didn't know him. We had to do this radio program together, and that's how I met him. So he's telling me this on the radio program. I didn't do that, but I'm thinking that. <laughs> and I said, okay, big boy, after the program went off, here's what I'll do. I'll use your paint. You give me the paint, and I'll do my next two my demos with your paint. We'll see. Yeah. So I did it. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> Michael, I'm a believer. So, yeah, I, I love Michael. I love him, Karen. I love their paint. Uh, uh, I love Peter's paint, Vasari. I think that's excellent quality paint. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I'm. You're, you're, I'm, you're, you're a Harding man at this point. Yeah, I'm using his, his paint. Uh, and he's been so wonderful to work with me uh, yeah. with that. And so, yeah, I love that paint. I like the paint to be like butter. Mm -hmm. the student grade comes out there like, well, I can't say. <laughs> well, we, I'd say stiff. Let's just say. Yeah, stiff. <laughs> yeah, stiff. And you're um, going to have to take some narcotics to fix that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let My question on this is the thing, one of the things I love about this, again, is what you were talking about earlier is there's no rendering in this, but it reads as beautifully rendered from a distance. When you are painting, are you constantly moving back and forth or are you doing it from one fixed uh, area? Well, here, here's, I think, the real trick with everything. You'll love this. The mirror never lies. <laughs> the mirror never lies. And so rather than most, you know, Garrett's taught me that, you know, when we were painting, you know, in his class and doing from life. To stand back, which is true, and look at it because you're people are up there, you know, a half a foot from their painting right. with a with a number one <laughs> little brush trying to you know do a portrait, and and he said stand back and look at it, and then then squint and look at the values, and so I will do that occasionally too. But my mirror is my best friend, man. I got I got here. I'll show everybody so they can see it. This is my wonderful. Look at all the paint rubbing off of my little. Uh, this is your makeup mirror. When I, I be out plain air painting and I'll be doing this and people will come by and then I'll go, <laughs> you know, I think I'm doing that, but no, it's your best friend because when you look at that, if it's looking right, man, you're on the right track and you, because see the problem is when we paint at such a rapid pace, you can only be so objective, but the mirror triples or quadruples your objectivity in a painting if you look at it in the mirror for the first time and it doesn't look great you got problems and you know what they usually are value mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fascinating the cw this, oh man i was gonna ask, wait but i still gotta ask you one more question yeah i have i have i have fallen in love with rosemary brush's monday mops Talk oh you are yeah i use them all I can't believe how something that looks moppish gives me a beautiful, I just did a gas pump painting and I needed to get a hose. The, you know, the, 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 I wanted to draw a hose. And I just wanted the hose to be a hose. I didn't want any brush strokes in the hose. It's like that oh, sky yeah. there. And I loaded up that mop and it's not a long, it's not long bristles. You know, I loaded it up and I drew it down and I got I got a three foot hose out of one stroke with a Monday mop. How, well, how, yeah. how, how did those come about? They're amazing brushes. I well, mean. my wonderful uh, friend who uh, and Rita Spalding, she's a doll and she uh, she's a really great uh, still life painter. And she and Gary Young, who's a really great friend of mine and a really great painter. Uh, they uh, both work, worked with me in my workshop. So I finally got to the point I realized I wanted to service the people better. So I got help. I made less money, but guess what? I was a lot more efficient to get, you know, good help. So she, she was painting these still lives with these mops brushes she got from some lady. And they were nothing more than like makeup, you know, just makeups. Makeup, sort of like makeup brushes. 
And so, but the hairs kept falling out. And so I said, I'm calling Rosemary and tell her I want her to make me mop brushes. And I sent her what they look like. She said, oh yeah, I got something that's sort of similar to that. Anyway, yeah, I'll be happy to. So she started calling them the Monday mops. You know, I didn't want to be like, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Bob Ross? Yeah, Bob Ross and have, you know, brushes named after me and all this and that. But she just, you know, she right. did it, so I didn't object. But anyway, so though I said on Facebook and I've told my students and, and I've told everybody, I think that brush is one of the most universal brushes out there because like you said you can make a one passage depending on the size of it and what you need you can make a one passage shot and it does everything because it, it'll, it'll you can do it so you have a soft edge on both sides of it when it and it lays down you can use it to feather edges like a big i like rosemary's i don't know if you use them but they're these big fan brushes let me get one here you got your blenders i don't know what This yep. thing here, look at the size of that. Yep. That's a big boy. But let me tell you, this thing's worth a million bucks. I it'll do it'll do beyond what the mops can do. And, and you can you can feather a whole section. Let's say, like, you know, we were talking about the trees in the back of that painting. Well, if I want to knock it down quickly, I just take that thing and, and hit it real lightly. It's all about the amount of pressure and everything. It's the same thing with a mop. But, you know, the other thing with a mop is you can get a straight edge on that thing like like you can with a, a little round. Right. So it's, it's like, and, and, and the brush works the best. I'm trying to find my finger, yeah. The brush works the best when you use medium, like I use Neil McGill. I don't use a lick one or anything like that, but I use Neil McGill. I did that on uh, when I started doing some real photorealistic uh, uh, still lifes that weren't rendered, but they were very, very tight and realistic. But yeah, I'm glad you like that. And I've had so many people say that they've learned to love those because it is a universal brush. It's got a lot of function. Yeah, the fan, Jeff, is is the Badger Blender. I it's I believe um, CW yeah. was holding up the number thirty seven, which is the biggest one they make. Yeah. It's an invaluable brush. I oh I, yeah, it's in my studio practice. I use it all the time. So you know, it's it's so neat to see it. it yeah, the, those the Monday mops and uh, a Badger Blender uh, are invaluable. Well, CW, this has been so much fun. Oh, now, I've I've had a blast. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, go visit CW Monday's website. Do you have videos, or do you do online teaching? Do you just do workshop? What's anything you need to flog, CW? Uh, no, I no, I stop. My wife, I'm 76. My wife, bless her heart, Rebecca is literally worn out with all the work that she she. I would not have had the career had it not been for all of her invaluable work i mean she is boy what a soldier and so you know we're at the point i'm 76 i got nothing to prove mm -hmm. you know and even when i taught workshops it wasn't i had anything to prove i had a lot i thought to teach to share that's just my nature my my nature is uh god's given me this gift of encouragement i'm an encourager i i love to encourage people whatever it is whether it's art or whatever so I love to teach, but it's it's time I don't do that. I don't have the time. I've turned I turn it down. I get so many requests, but you know, right now I'm at a set with this new triad palette that you're gonna try. I am so so blown away from it that I you know, I when have I got up at five thirty in the morning to go paint? I don't know if I ever did, but I did the other day. I was chomping at the bit. Awesome. Well, if 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 I can be as enthusiastic as you are at 76, I'll be very happy to be that person. So thank you, CW. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again, CW. Thank you, Charlie. You're awesome, baby. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.